thank you so much, Hugo. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Melissa Dowland, and I am the teacher education coordinator for the museum. So mostly I work with teachers, but every year for Bugfest, my staff person, Megan, and I, as well as my husband, Mike, go out and collect all sorts of caterpillars and have them at a table to show everyone. Now, of course, this year we weren't able to have a table at Bugfest to show everybody our caterpillars. But instead, I'm going to give you a little talk um, about caterpillars and share all sorts of fun and exciting things. Um, and there's a lot of these pictures here are my husband's my husband and Mike's pictures that he's taken of the caterpillars that we've had at Bugfest over the many years. And so lots of fun things to see here. So I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see all of these awesome pictures and tell you some interesting things about caterpillars. Um, I think we're good to go. Somebody speak up if you can't see my slides. But um, here we go. Caterpillarology made up word, but the study of caterpillars, something that I think is amazing and love to share with other people. So caterpillars are amazing. We have tons of them in North Carolina. We have 177 species of butterflies. We have 2,267 2, species of moths and they all have caterpillars because of course a caterpillar is the larva or the immature stage of a butterfly or a moth. So all butterflies and moths go through a caterpillar phase. And um, so let's talk a little bit about how does that work? What, um, you know, we're gonna kind of launch into all of that and we're gonna talk a little bit also about the kinds of things that caterpillars have to deal with during their life. But first, I have a little mystery for you. Take a look at this picture on the screen and I want you to type in the chat, what do you notice about it? And what does it remind you of? What do you think it looks like? Um, so let's see. Share a few of your thoughts in the chat about this picture and what you think it reminds you of or what you notice on it. Ooh, Abby said it looks like a cactus. I agree. It kind of does look like a cactus, like a barrel cactus, right? Um, anybody else have any thoughts about what this looks like? Miranda says she thinks it looks like seeds. Oh, I kind of agree with that one too. I notice a lot of little ridges running down the sides of it. Watermelon, Hugo, good suggestion. I like that too. Oh, Les thinks it might be an egg. Les, do you have any evidence for your thought that it looks like an egg? Anything that helps you believe that it might be an egg? Or is it just some knowledge that you happen to have already? <laughs> well, these are in fact Yep, less is because butterflies make eggs. Yeah, these are in fact some eggs from a butterfly. And that is of course the first stage of a caterpillar's life. So how do they get there? You know, we have things, the adults, the butterflies and the moths lay eggs on plants that their babies are gonna like to eat. And so they're very careful and they lay them on the right plants for their caterpillar. Um, they're very tiny, tiny usually but they do come in all sorts of amazing shapes and sizes. So each different species of butterfly or moth has a very different egg. And there's our example, the one that looks like a cactus or a watermelon or a seed, um, that is just one of the many varieties of eggs that exist for all of the species of butterflies and moths we have around here. So that egg develops a little bit. It usually turns kind of clearish or dark colored right before it's about ready to hatch and then out chews its way a little tiny caterpillar. And what does that caterpillar do right away? Well, he ate some of his eggshell, so he has to make his very first caterpillar poop. And then most of that time, the time that caterpillar also turns around and eats its eggshell. Because why waste those nutrients? There's lots of good things in that eggshell. So the caterpillar goes, goes ahead and eats that up. And then it begins to eat the plant that it likes to feed on, hopefully the one its mom laid it on, and it starts to grow. And so caterpillars typically go through about five phases or instars as they grow, getting bigger in each phase or instar. And you can see how this monarch changes a little bit as it gets bigger. It's tentacles on the end, the filaments on both ends get a little bit longer, the caterpillar gets larger until it reaches its fifth and final instar. And caterpillars are pretty amazing because the amount they grow is pretty phenomenal. So an example, if you started with this little tiny caterpillar here, this is um, a hickory horn devil caterpillar and it starts out like really, really, really tiny. 
by the time it grows up, this is our largest caterpillar in North America. It gets to be about the size of a hot dog, about six inches long, and kind of, you know, pretty big around. If a human baby grew the same amount as that caterpillar grows, by the time it was done growing, it would be almost as big as Trouble the Whale. And if you've ever been to the museum downtown, you may have seen Trouble's skeleton hanging from the ceiling over the coastal gallery on the first floor. And Trouble's pretty big. He's almost more than 50 feet long, I think. And so that human baby would have to be as big as a whale. So, I mean, that'd be tough. If I got to be as big as a whale, my skin would be all stretchy. I would have trouble fitting in there. So caterpillars have a really special way to deal with this. They shed their skin as they grow. So each caterpillar phase between those instars, the caterpillar molts. So it grows the new caterpillar skin underneath its old one. It busts out the back and it wriggles its way out of the caterpillar skin. If we have any kids watching at home, it's a good time to do a little caterpillar um, skin removal wiggle. The caterpillar works its way out of the skin and leaves it right behind it. And then again, don't waste any nutrients. A lot of times that caterpillar turns around and goes ahead and eats the skin that it just shed. Kind of gross, but also not very wasteful. It's using all of those um, nutrients that were in that skin. And oh, Laura Beth said that they, there was a caterpillar inching movement in bug yoga, that'd be another good one to wiggle around in your chair with. And so that's the way caterpillars can accommodate all of the massive amount of growth that they go through over the course of their life. Um, and like I said, usually they have about five instars, though some species have more or less than that, um, but they go through those phases. And then they're ready to change because of course, you know the, what's coming next, right? They gotta turn themselves into a butterfly or moth. And so they get it, go into a phase called their pre-pupil phase, um, which is like they're getting ready to transform. And then they shed that last caterpillar skin and transform into, in this case, chrysalis. Now in that pre-pupa stage, a lot of times they change color right before pupating. It's like a sign that they're ready to pupate. So if you ever see, we, you know, we talked about that, that Eastern tiger tail, those of you who were here a little earlier, um, that one is still green, but pretty soon he's pretty big. He's going to turn brown and get ready to turn into to his chrysalis. So here's another example. This is a spice bush swallowtail. It turns this vivid orange color, which is really cool. It hangs itself up like a telephone repairman, attaches its bottom with some silk down on the stick, makes a loop to go around its back and kind of hangs there, and then wriggles out of its caterpillar skin and becomes a chrysalis. So again, you can do your telephone repair and do a little wriggling if you're, you know, sitting in a chair too long. Um, but caterpillars are, <laughs> butterfly chrysalids come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, some amazingly weird looking things, like one of my very favorite, the one in the middle there, the cloudless sulfur butterfly, makes that beautiful pink, pointy, strange looking thing. It is so weird. Its head it end is the down pointing part, I'm pretty sure. A lot of other, a lot of times, Caterpillars will either hang up by their tail or they'll stay upright along this, this twig with like their telephone repairman sort of a posture. It's pretty cool. Here's a bunch of moth pupa. Now they tend to be less excitingly colored and shaped because they a lot of times are either wrapped up in a cocoon or under the ground, but there's still a lot of variety in them. And you can really see things like the big proboscis on a couple of the ones on the left that's curled over at the top. It's pretty neat. Um, and just to be clear, so a moth, you know, you hear about moths making cocoons, a lot of moths do make cocoons, but if you open up that cocoon, what's inside is the pupa. And so here's a quick little explanation of how that works. Pupa is the general word that means like, it means cocoon, it means chrysalis, it means pupa, it covers all of those things. It's the general word for that phase. If you're a butterfly, you turn into a chrysalis and it's, it's a naked pupa, it doesn't have anything around it. If you're a moth, you either will make a cocoon, wrap yourself in silk, and have a pupa inside of the cocoon, or a lot of moths will bury into the dirt to transform into their pupa. And so you have, again, a kind of a naked pupa, but usually in the dirt. So if you're digging around in your garden, you happen to find something that looks like a little mummy, that is probably what it is, it is a moth pupa, which is pretty cool. So kind of keep things fun and interactive here. We got quiz time. So what do you think these are going to become? Um, 
Are they going to become a butterfly or moths? we got four choices here. If you want to share in the chat, which ones you think are butterflies and which ones you think are moths, take a moment, look at them, and see what you think. And I'll give you a hint in just a second here, too. So anybody have any guesses as to which ones are butterflies and which ones are moths out of these weird looking caterpillars on the screen? <laughs> Ooh, Taylor, we got a butterfly moth, butterfly moth. Hugo, we got all moths. <laughs> all right, think about it for another couple seconds and I'm gonna give you a little hint. See how well you're paying attention to our discussion of pupa. So here is what the pupal phase of each of these looks like. So now does this change your answer at all to know what the pupa looks like for each of them? It's tricky, but it might help you out a little bit. So take another just a couple seconds to see if you change your answers at all. And I'm gonna give you the answers here in just a second. All righty. Oh, Les, I see an answer change there. Nice work. Way to use the clue. So here we go. So the first one is a butterfly. It's a tiger swallowtail. So we already kind of talked about that one a little bit, but you can see here again the chrysalis hanging there by the silk. Now the next one, the number two there, is a moth. And as you saw in his pupil phase, it makes a cocoon. The third one, tricky, because it's kind of drab looking. You might think, oh, that's going to be an ugly moth, right? Well, it's just a bird poop mimic. We'll talk about it more later. But it has a chrysalis. It hangs up. Still looks like bird poop. And then out comes a beautiful red spotted purple moth. And then that last one, tricky, a really cute green caterpillar. But he turns into, he buries in the soil, turns into the, one of those brown pupas in the soil, and gets to be one of our really cool day flying moths, which is pretty cool, the hummingbird moth. We have a few species of day flying moths like that with those clear wings, which are really cool. So, um, all right, so let's talk about some, if you happen to have some caterpillars around, some of the cool things that you can observe about them. And so we're gonna start with another kind of little quiz here. Look at this caterpillar. Which end do you think is the, is the head? The left end or the right end? And why do you think that? So let me know in the chat, what do you think? Which end is the head? Left or right? Anybody have any guesses? We we got a right. We got one right. We went a left. Oh, good discussion here. Deb and Abby can have some discussion as to why. Katie and Evie are divided. Pretty tricky, huh? Caterpillars are pretty smart like this. Like if I was a bird, which end would I want to bite first, you know? And if I was the caterpillar, would I want that end to be my head? Alrighty. Ready for the answer? Here it is. It's the right end is the head of the caterpillar. But it is kind of tricky. That little horn on the back end there, that might be a good diversion if you were trying to fool somebody into thinking, say, you were a unicorn. All right, you ready for an even tougher one? Here's a really tricky one. Which end of this one is the head? The top or the bottom? Hmm. This one's really tough. Really tough. <laughs> We got a bottom and a top. <laughs> oh man, lots of confusion. All right, I got a hint for you. From the side, that might give you a little hint as to which end is the top and the bottom. Anybody change their answer? <laughs> Katie and Evie are going bottom. Mm-hmm. All righty. Ready for the answer on this one? Pretty tricky. It is the bottom, and this is really tricky. But the best way to tell is to look at the legs, and we're gonna talk about them more in just a second, but you see those spiky legs, those are near the head, and those squishy legs, those are near the tail. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a second. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things you can see on the caterpillar, right? So they have three body parts like most insects do, you know, head and thorax, abdomen, right? Everybody sing along head and thorax, abdomen. Um, and so, but on a caterpillar, they don't look that different. The head is kind of tucked in at the front, and then there's three segments that make up the thorax, and then they have 10 segments that make up the abdomen. Looking more closely at their heads, if you have a really big caterpillar, you can see some cool things. So you have eyes. They have six little dots on each side of their head that are called ocelli, and those are eyes. Their antenna are tiny little things up near their face. Not any of those like tentacly things on their body. The antennas are like tiny things near their face. 
And then they have a big old mandible that comes in from the side to chew on things. You can't see it very well in this picture, but I'll show you a better one in just a sec. And then they have these weird things called maxillary palps like below their mouth that help direct the leaf into their mouth to make sure that they can get the food that they need. And then at the bottom there, you can see that first pair of true legs on the caterpillar. Um, so I have a uh, video of caterpillar eating here. See if you can see some of those things. See if you can see the antenna and the mandib mandibles and maybe the maxillary palps. And in the background, I'm gonna turn on the sound of a whole bunch of caterpillars chewing. And look at how fast that thing eats that leaf. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is faster than real life, but still, that's impressive. And watch as he turns here. You're really gonna get to see when he turns his head a little bit here, you can see those maxillary palps on the sides. You can see his antennas. And then you really see when he comes around to the side here, the black bits that look like, I don't know, shoe horns or something coming in from the sides of the leaf. And that's the mandibles. So pretty cool, huh? To watch them that close up. They really are leaf eating machines. In fact, one of my favorite field guides describes them as like basically tubes for eating and growing. That's all they really are. Okay, so back to the legs, I talked about a little bit briefly already. So look at this one here. How many legs does this caterpillar have? Can you count them up? How many do you think it has? Share that one in the chat. How many? Oh, and while you're counting, let's ask, does that guy bite the one we just watched a video of? And no, not really. Um, those jaws are not really powerful enough. They could probably pinch a little bit if you like wedged your finger in exactly the right spot, but no, they don't really bother you. So nothing to worry about. We'll talk a little bit about a few of the, the caterpillars you want to watch out for later on in the program. Oh man, we got lots of different answers here. 16, 14, 10, 8. Again, it's tricky because caterpillars have two different types of legs. All right, how many legs insects have, right? Insects have six legs. Wait, but I thought caterpillars were a type of insect. They're part of an insect life cycle. How do they have more legs? Well, here's how. So they have three pairs of true legs. Those are their six insect legs, and they're the spiky ones up near their head. So it's three on each side, spiky, true legs that are their insect legs. But then they also, most caterpillars, not all caterpillars, but most caterpillars have five pairs of pro legs, and we call them pro legs because they are only in the first phase, um, including that one back pair, the claspers, that are kind of weird looking, the anterior pro legs, or the um, anal pro legs at the very end of the caterpillar. So that's six, six true legs and 10 pro legs for a total of 16 legs on this guy. So here you go. Here's all 16 legs on this guy. Now there's a few species of caterpillars that do not have all 10 pro legs. The inchworms only have two pairs of pro legs. So they're down to what is that? Six true legs plus four pro legs, 10 legs on the inchworms. And that is why the inchworm moves a little bit more differently than some, you know, most caterpillars kind of scooch along, just moving their body segments. But the inchworm, he has to do his inching because he's only got those two pairs of pro legs. And so you can see how he moves. He curls up his body, moves along, kind of reaches out to sense where he wants to go and then curls up and moves again. So a little bit of a different style of movement. So caterpillars typically have four or 10 pro legs, but not more than that. So here's a trick question for you. Is this a caterpillar or not? Pretty tricky. He's got, look at those three spiky legs in the front. So that's the six true legs, but how many pro legs in the back there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of pro legs. Uh-oh, too many. This is a trick one. This is a soft fly, not a caterpillar. And the soft flies also often have an S shape to their bodies. And it's just a different type of insect, turns into something completely different, not a butterfly or a moth. So very tricky, soft flies. And then also, there are this group called the slug caterpillars, which really don't, you can't really see all of these features on them. In fact, you look at one from below, and they don't really have those pro legs on their body. They're more like kind of a squishy tube of goo that scooches along. And in fact, I think that you can kind of see his true legs up near his head, but even them, I find them hard to see. 
Um, but the slug caterpillars are a really cool group of caterpillars. So, so I'll show you some more of those later too. All right, one more of another fun thing for you. What does this thing remind you of? Look at that. Now, I'm sure you know that it has something to do with a caterpillar, but what does it actually look like? I think maybe like an alien mouth. I don't know, an eyeball. <laughs> Deb just said weird. Mm -hmm. Oh, Katie and everything, it looks like, like a leaf. I think that, 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 that for sure has, is, it looks like a leaf too. Or a pea pod with no peas. Mm. Those are my favorite kind of peas, actually, the ones that don't have very big peas inside of them. Stingray mouth. Ooh, or an ear. Ooh, I like these guesses. Lots of interesting ideas. All right, are you ready to learn what it really is? Ooh, a closed eye, a mouth. Mm hmm. Yeah, kind of a scary mouth. Looks like when you get sucked into in a science fiction film. What it actually is, is a breathing pore, a spiracle. So caterpillars don't have lungs like we do. They have tubes running through their body. So the air has to just kind of passively flow through them. And so they have holes. Oh, Carrie, I like that. The eye of Sauron. I agree. Absolutely. But they have holes all along their body to let the um, air in and out of their body to exchange gases so that they can breathe. And so as you can see here, this caterpillar has spiracles all along its abdomen as what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight along its abdomen. And then usually there's a slightly larger spiracle up near its head on its thorax to kind of feed the tubes in the upper part of its body. So, um, and these look a little different from that mystery one. This is from the Scropia caterpillar and this is an imperial caterpillar. Um, and a lot of times the spiracles have like colorful things around them, but really at the heart, what they are is like a slit, a tiny hole in the caterpillar's body. And you can kind of see the mark in the middle of the white part is where this caterpillar actually lets the air in and out. All right, one more like this. Now, what does this remind you of? What do you think it might be? Anybody, anybody have any thoughts or evidence to support their thoughts? <laughs> Abby said frass. We'll have to talk about frass here in just a minute. And Deb thinks a vegetable? Yeah, not one I really want to eat though. Ooh, a germ. Mm hmm I could see that too. It almost looks like it's got a little bit of like chopped up chard in it right there. <laughs> a pine cone. I like that. It has kind of the segmenting of a pine cone, almost like the scales on a pine cone. I like that too. Alrighty. Are you ready to see this thing being made? Poop. Yes, Hugo, this is the appropriate moment in the program to share the word poop or a poop emoji in the chat because that's exactly what it is. Check it out. This is one of these being made up very, very close. Isn't it amazing? Oh my gosh, there it goes. Ah! That was very exciting. Oh, that was so great. <laughs> and don't worry, I show you again in slow motion. So look at that. The frass is made on the inside of the caterpillar. It has this like slimy green organy bit. It opens up the trap door of its back end and it pushes it out. Nice work, Cecropia caterpillar. And then it closes up the trap door at its behind. It's pretty amazing. And so all of those things that pine, uh, that Sam said kind of look like a pine cone, a lot of times caterpillar frass has little like indentations. It almost looks like a seed. Um, so there's lots of cool things that you can, it's an easy thing to like help you find caterpillars because it's like this very distinctive shaped thing. So, alrighty. So let's talk a little bit more about the natural history of caterpillars because boy, their, life, their goal in life is really just to eat. They just want to keep eating and eating and eating and, and frassing and frassing, frassing, which, oh, I forgot to say, Abby said the word frass. Frass is the word for caterpillar or insect poop. F-R-A-S-S -S is the word for caterpillar poop. What a great vocab word is that. So a caterpillar's goal in life, eat frass and not be eaten. So... Poor caterpillars. There's a lot of things out there that like to come and get them. Spiders, like this guy, chomping down, jumping spider. Wasps are huge fans of eating caterpillars. They'll often like just use their sharp jaws and cut a little caterpillar ball out and take it back to their babies. Caterpillars are really important for birds, especially when they're feeding their babies, because baby birds rely, a lot of species rely on eating caterpillars. So they're really an important part of the ecosystem. They also have lots of parasitoids, things that lay their eggs in the caterpillar. The larvae eat the caterpillar from the inside while it's still alive. And then they pop out and spin their cocoons 
and become adult wasps. So these are pecanid wasps. And there's also parasitic flies and um, probably a few other things, like a bunch of different things that will parasitize caterpillars. And you may have seen these if you have tomato plants and you have tobacco hornworms on them like this. It's a really common phenomenon with those tobacco hornworms. So if you really want to grow your tomatoes and not your caterpillars, you should leave the ones with the little white Q-tips on them because those are not really helping the caterpillars at all. So they will, they will typically die after this. They, can't, they cannot turn into a pupa after they've been parasitized by, like, by that. So what's a caterpillar to do? This is a caterpillar um, hunter wasp. It stings the caterpillar, it shoves it in its nest hole in the ground and lays its eggs so that it, when its babies hatch, they can eat the parasitized caterpillar. Poor caterpillar. So what would you do if you were a caterpillar to try to protect yourself? I mean, you don't have that many choices. You're a caterpillar. Can't build a house, or can you? Hmm. Oh, you could hide. Lynn, that's a great suggestion. Definitely. Try to hide. And ooh, hide by camouflage. Good answer, Abby. I like that. Tabitha, you want some suggestions? We'll give you some here in just a second. <laughs> Ooh, spit poison, rosemary. I like that. Make a burrow. Eat poison. Huh. Yeah. Good suggestions, all of these. You all might survive if you were caterpillars. Very good. And this is exactly what a lot of caterpillars do. So a lot of times they try to blend in to hide. Um, like this guy that looks literally very much just like the twig. It's the thing on the right, on the top, that's the caterpillar. Pretty amazing. Yeah. How about this one? So they like to look like the thing they're on. So look at that thing. There's a caterpillar on that one on the right that blends right in. You can see his little pro legs. I don't know if you'll be able to see my cursor. It's kind of small, but his little pro legs right there hanging on to the lichens, blending in really well. How about this one? Can you tell there's a caterpillar in this picture? I mean, it's hard to tell, right? Where's the caterpillar? Oh, there's a close up. He is right on the edge of a leaf, and I mean, that's some pretty perfect camouflage, if I do say so myself. Another one, look at the spots on the leaf and the spots on the caterpillar, and how well that caterpillar mimics the leaf that it's feeding on. Pretty amazing. And another favorite of mine, the camouflage looper that actually sticks pieces of the plant on its back with a little bit of silk so that it blends right in with the thing that it's hanging out on. And so it actually decorates itself to hide and to blend in. And then some are a little less, you know, specifically camouflage, but they just, they hang out on the bottoms of leaves often. Um, a lot of times this kind of caterpillar will be lined up right with the leaf vein, so it'll blend in there. So definitely that hiding thing or hanging by a thread at nighttime, a lot of inchworms will hang down on their thread just to try to hide. So some of them do actually build a shelter, like the bagworm that takes pieces of whatever it's on and it builds a silk case and it sticks those things onto its case. And it lives in this thing while it's a caterpillar and while it's a pupa. And so it'll stick its little caterpillar head out the top and feed on the tree. And then when it's ready to turn into a pupa, it pulls itself down inside, it seals up the bag and it transforms into a pupa. And in fact, if it's a female, it never comes out of the bag. The female bagworms are flightless, so they never actually leave the bag. The males have to come find them at the bag, and then they lay eggs, and then they die. It's a very sad life. Um, here's another house builder. Sometimes if you find a black locust or wisteria or a pea family plant where the leaves are sewn together like this, and you tease them apart just a little bit, you'll find the silver spotted skipper hiding out inside. Or if you see a red bud leaf that's folded over like this and you open it up, you might find a red bud leaf folder hiding inside. He's built a little silk there to pull that leaf closed. Somebody said eat poison and that is exactly what monarch caterpillars do. They eat milkweed plants and the, the toxins in the milkweed plants make them distasteful to predators and so they um, avoid predation because they taste bad or are poisonous, which is pretty amazing. But they can handle the poison, right? It doesn't kill them, just the things that eat them. It just hurts them. Um, another thing is looking like something nothing else wants to eat, like say looking like bird poop. If you're a bird, you might not want to eat your own poop. And so things like the viceroy and the red spotted purple caterpillars mimic bird poop, even to the point where they like dribble themselves off of the stick so that it really looks like poop. And these guys, I showed you this one earlier, but their chrysalis also looks like bird poop, which is kind of amazing. Like their whole caterpillar and pupil life is bird poop. 
and then they're a beautiful caterpillar. I mean, a beautiful butterfly when they come out. They're either, um, the ones that look like this are red spotted purples and viceroys, and viceroys look like monarchs, and I showed you the red spotted purple either as like kind of black with iridescence and some orange spots. It's beautiful. There's another strategy too, to be a stinging caterpillar. And so stinging caterpillars, it's not that they bite you or have a stinger really like a, like a wasp or, um, or a bee stinger, they have stinging spines. And so the spines on their body, you can actually see the little tips in this picture. They break off, they have a little bit of venom in them and it stings. Um, and so if you've ever been stung on it by one of these, I have not, I have avoided it thus far, but I hear it's pretty painful, especially certain species. Here's another stinger, the saddleback. This is one of the common ones that we have a lot around um, the Triangle area in North Carolina. So one to know and not brush up against. Now, if it crawled on your hand, it wouldn't sting you. But if you brushed on those spines, it would. This is one of our biggest, the IO moth. It gets to be pretty big when it's full grown and it's a stinger. And the white flannel moth and the nascent slug. A lot of the slug caterpillars are stingers. Um, so just some ones to recognize. and. Um, check out, know a little bit about, and then the deadly, not really, but the puss moth. This, from what I have heard, is the worst stinger of all. It has spines kind of hidden under its very furry, like I want to pet you because you look like a little kitty cat, um, but underneath that furry bit is the, the stingers that'll get you, and um, I had a coworker once who stung himself on purpose because he wanted to know what it felt like, and he called poison control because he was in a lot of pain. He survived. He's just fine but it's one you don't really want to mess with. So this is a good one to be able to recognize if you want to avoid a stinging caterpillar. But most caterpillars are totally fine to touch and safe and nothing to worry about at all. Another strategy, this one's one of my favorite. This one's just so weird. It um, keeps the head capsules. Those three things coming off its head there are the cap head capsules from previous molts. So when it sheds its caterpillar skin, it like sticks its head capsule onto its new body so that it hangs onto them and then it whips its head back and forth and shakes those capsules when it gets disturbed. So, you know, you need to wiggle again. Everybody do the Harris's three spot wiggle. Um, and somebody said spit poison. Well, in this case, not quite spit, but it has distasteful tails that it like extends out and whips around when something comes to bother it. So the two fork bits there, that's its tail end. And so it will whip those around to try to um, scare away predators. And oh man, this one is the only one I know that we have around here like it, but this caterpillar actually makes a noise. Listen to this. Who would have guessed? A caterpillar that can squeal, which is pretty amazing. Oh, and then great question, Deb. You anticipated my next slide here. Some of them have stinky antennae. They're not exactly antennae, but when they're disturbed, they stick this orange forked organ out of the of their head. It's called an osmaterium, which um, somebody can, ta I can type in the chat here because it's a weird word, osmaterium. Let me go back to him. And it, again, is distasteful. It kind of is a little acidic and it's distasteful to predators. So it's a defense mechanism for the swallowtail caterpillar. So all of the swallowtail caterpillars, at least as far as I know, all of them have an osmaterium that they use in a very similar way to the one pictured here. And then sometimes they just emit goo from both ends. Now, this isn't necessarily distasteful goo. It's just, you know, shoot some goo out. And so like something to avoid. And this guy also likes to be part of a tough group. So that's another defense strategy. A lot of caterpillars will hang out together in a group to look a lot scarier as a big group. And um, maybe also, you know, a little of like, well, if the bird eats one of us, then the rest of us are still okay. So they use that as a strategy, strategy too. Um, yeah, Deb said that the osmaterium is very stinky. I would totally agree. If you get it on your finger accidentally, your finger smells like that for quite a while. Um, that'd be a great question. Do all spiky or fuzzy looking caterpillars sting? And the answer is no, definitely not. Um, these guys, this big tough group does not sting. And a lot of the, the furry and fuzzy caterpillars do not sting. So it's good to get to know a few of them so you know which ones to avoid, um, but feel safe touching some of the other ones if you want to, because it's a lot of fun to be able to pick up a caterpillar. So here, one last example. This one kind of does it all. 
This is the spice bush swallowtail. As a little caterpillar, it's a bird poop mimic, and it looks, I mean, like, look at that. that ooh, it looks drizzly. And then it also makes a rolled leaf shelter by laying down a pad of silk to pull the leaf closed around it. It also has fake eyes that make it look like a snake. And in fact, these guys will puff their heads, or well, it's actually their thorax, but they'll puff their thorax up a little bit to make those eyes look even more snake-like when they're disturbed. And it also has that osmeterium, the chemical warfare. I mean, and just check out these fake eyes. Look at that. It, I mean, it, the white in it is the color that they actually have in them to make it look like a wet eyeball. It's not really wet. It just looks like it. And it's not even an eye. It's a fake eye spot, which is pretty amazing. I feel like they do a good job of trying to hide themselves. All right, so now I know what you're all thinking. You're like, wow, caterpillars are amazing. I need to go find me some. And right now is one of the best times of year to go find caterpillars. They're all getting big. They're pretty awesome. So a couple things to look for. Look for host plants. Host plants are the caterpillars or the plants that caterpillars eat as caterpillars, you know, the, that they have to eat when they're growing up. And a lot of our native species of plants are really good host plants. Trees, um, milkweeds for monarchs, um, a lot of uh, moth species will eat different species of trees, so having native trees around is a great thing to have too. Um, when you're out there looking, a couple things you can look for, really the best things to look for are frass on the ground under a branch and chewed leaves. And then you look up and you're like, okay, where's the caterpillar? Right above where that frass is. And so that's a good thing to look for. Sometimes you can catch the adult laying eggs on the host plant and then you could watch them their whole life cycle. And another trick too to find caterpillars is to go out at night. A lot of times with a flashlight, it's easier to find them than it is during the day. Or as Hugo mentioned at the very beginning before some of y'all were here, UV light makes some species of caterpillars glow. And so if you go out at night with a UV flashlight, it makes it easier to find, especially some of the big like fat green ones will glow and the slug caterpillars will grow. A lot of the hornworms will glow. grow glow. So that's a good thing to do. Um, yeah, and Abby mentioned parsley for black swallowtails. Black swallowtails eat anything in the parsley family. So parsley, dill, fennel, rue, um, even a native wildflower called golden alexander. That's probably their like real native um, host plant. So that's a good choice to try to find things. Um, and I'm going to come, Deb, I saw your comment. I'm going to come back to that one in a minute. Okay. Um, another thing too, so caterpillar wrangling, if you find some caterpillars and you want to observe them for a few days, here's some ideas of how you can take care of them. Um, you might want something to put them in. Having something with mesh sides is really good so they can climb up on the sides and get around. Um, you also want to make sure that you get the food plant that they were eating eating. So if they were on a beech tree, get some beech leaves. If they were on a milkweed plant, bring in some milkweed. Although milkweed doesn't last very well in cages. I'll just give you an FYI on that one. Um, we also sometimes use for short-term caterpillar care um, some less of traditional things like a Ziploc bag with a paper towel and a little floral tube with plant leaves in it. Um, or, you know, salad containers really work well. Um, oh, I already said this, but I'll reiterate it. Make sure that you have the right kind of food for them. Um, that you know what kind of plant they were on. And then make sure that you don't have a way for the caterpillar to crawl down into the water. Because unfortunately, this happens more often to me than I would like. If you don't cover like all the little holes, they will crawl down because they like to crawl down the branches at night and they will drown themselves in the water. So try to avoid that because it's very sad when it happens. And then if you're going to hang on to them for a while, I mean, you can just watch them for a few days and let them go. It's always a good idea. But if you want to hang on to caterpillars and see what they turn into, you got to make sure that they have the right places to pupate. So you got to know if they need a stick to hang up on, a ceiling to hang up on, if they need dirt to dig down into. So you got to do a little research and make sure that they have what they need. And then over the winter, then you need to keep them outside because they need moisture and cold to successfully transform. And if you have them in a container, you might even have to mist them a little bit because if they're not getting rained on like they would in the wild, you might have to add a little bit of extra um, water to them, you know, with like a mister bottle. So anyway, just some tips. And I'd be happy to talk more about that if anybody's really interested in keeping, hanging on to some caterpillars for a little while. But you can also just go out and find them and watch them in the wild, which is actually one of the best ways to do it and a lot less work than caring for caterpillars. All right, so to wrap things up here, it's your turn to tell me what you think of the caterpillars. So I got some polls I'm going to launch for you. And it's your turn to vote. 
So the first award we're gonna give is for the best fake eyes. All right, so I'm gonna launch a poll here and you tell me which is your favorite, the Spicebush Swallowtail, the Tiger Swallowtail, the Silver Spotted Skipper, or the Saddleback. So here you go. Hopefully you can see the poll on the screen. Take a look at the pictures and choose your favorite for the best fake eyes. Everybody throw a vote in there. Let's see who's gonna win. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds. I see we got some more people in here that haven't voted yet, so feel free to take a moment and do that. Oh man, this is exciting. There's a landslide winner here, no debate. Oh, but somebody finally voted for the Silver Spotted Skipper. Thank you, he's so cute. All right, I'm gonna close in a couple seconds. Get your votes in. All righty, now I'll share you the results. I Hopefully you can see this, but man, the Spice Bush Wallowtail won by a landslide. I did kind of toot his horn earlier with that whole watery thing going on. Those are pretty good fake eyes. Tiger Swallowtail, the Silver Spotted Skipper, and the Saddleback all got one vote. I, I love that Silver Spotted Skipper, man. You open up his leaf house and you see those orange dots and you're like, whoa, but really they're just fake eyes. Pretty cool. All right. So for your next poll, you get to vote for the best hairdo between the spotted apatolotes, the sycamore tussock, the puss caterpillar, and the yellow-haired dagger. So let me launch that poll. Hang on, where did it go? Here we go, best hairdo coming your way. All right, get your votes in, get your votes in. And yeah, if you don't see the poll for some reason, feel free to type an answer in the chat. Hopefully you can see the poll, but if you can't, type an answer in the chat too. Oh man, this is a much tighter race, so everybody better vote. I don't know. This is a, this is a tight race here. Hmm. Okay, a couple more seconds. I think we got most everybody in here. Alrighty. You ready for the results? Who do you think won the poll? We just got an extra vote for the Sycamore Tustic, and I'm going to share the results. Hopefully you can see them. The Sycamore Tussock took it away with 44% of the vote. He does, I mean, that's pretty cute. It's hard to compete with that. Although I must say my, probably my favorite out of these guys is Spotted Apatolotes, but not because of his hairdo, because of his shoes. The Spotted Apatolotes has red pro leg ends. His crochets, his little crochets on the tip of his feet and it is adorable. So really, I guess it's not his hairdo, it's his shoes but he is one of my favorites, the Spotted Apatolotes. All right, we got two more coming. Here's the next one, best camouflage. You've seen these guys before, so I'm gonna go ahead and find my best camo poll and launch that for you. What do you think? Checkered fringe prominent, the Ilia underwing that looks like lichen, the twig, twig mimic guy, or the one that camouflages himself with stuff on, stuck on his body. Leaf edge, lichen, twig, or flower parts. These are your choices. All right, a few more folks. All righty. Last few seconds on this poll. We got votes for one and two. All right, I got yours, Katie and Evie. All righty. Ooh, number two is ranking, racking up a few extras. All right, let me share the results here. The winner. The little tighter race is the Ilya Underwing, especially with those extra couple votes from the chat. Got it close to 50% of, of the vote. Um, second place was that checkered fringe prominent though. Um, Cause that one, I mean, look at that. That's pretty impressive. I feel like that guy does a pretty good job of blending in too, but there are really some good strategies. Alrighty, last but not least, you get to vote for the very weirdest caterpillar of all. There's the Harris's three spot with his head capsules that he likes to whip around. There's the monkey slug caterpillar that looks like it has a lot of arms, but not really. They're just like fleshy appendages that fall off when it pupates. There's the white mark tussock with his brilliant red and yellow and white coloration, or the spun glass slug that actually looks like somebody spun some glass, which is I think pretty amazing. So here you go, chance to vote. Which one do you think is the weirdest of all? Or if you have an alternative and it's not on the screen, you could type a different one in the chat if you like other as an answer. <laughs> I 
Ooh, one and two and four in the chat. I will add those in. Pretty good, pretty good. All right, last couple seconds. Get your vote in if you haven't. All righty. Well, boy, oh boy, Monkey Slug took it away with 60% of the vote. Harris's three spot, though, I'm proud of him. He got, he got like 30% of the vote there for second place. And the Spun Gloss did pretty good. Poor White Mark Tussick, though. Ugh. I must say, though, the Monkey Slug. I mean, how do you compete with that thing? It is so weird. It's a pretty amazing thing, I think. Um, so look at that. I mean, from the underside, even. Ooh, kind of creepy. So now that you all love caterpillars, and I know you do, here's a few things you can do to help them. You can plant native plants at your house, things that caterpillars and butterflies and moths all like to eat. You can learn more about them by um, getting a field guide or two and learning more about them. You can also try, if you want to learn more, bugguide.net is a great resource for all things bug. Um, and a favorite of mine is the Caterpillar Lab. It's a group, a nonprofit up in the Northeast in Massachusetts. And if you follow them online, they post amazing videos and photos of caterpillars every day. It's pretty cool. But most importantly, just get on out there and enjoy some caterpillars. Like I said, this time of year is the best time. So here's just a few of the ones we've had at Bugfest in the past that you could go out and look for right now. The drab prominent, who's nothing but drab. The four-horned sphinx, one of the few sphinx caterpillars that has weird protuberances on other parts of its body. Look at this one. I love this one. The stinging rose caterpillar comes in a couple different colors. The turbulent phosphillas you saw before, they like to hang out in groups, so you definitely don't know which is the head and which is the tail. And the smartweed, I mean, look at the colors on that guy. Pretty cool. Caterpillar does all the work, but the butterfly gets all the publicity. I hope you don't agree with that anymore now that you've heard about all of these caterpillars. And I hope that you now love caterpillars because caterpillars even have smiley faces on their rear ends like this tulip silk, tulip tree silk moth. So there you go. Um, Deb, I'm gonna go back to your question. And if anybody has any others, please feel free to um, drop them in the chat. Um, and I would be more than happy if you have like random pictures of caterpillars, you need my ID. I'm always happy to help with that because I love caterpillars and I'm always excited to help people learn more about them. So, all right. Deb, that was a long question. Let me see what I got from you. Um, let me go find that one. So I have a swallowtail female that's fully formed and showing all normal behaviors. Very good, but can't, um, can't fully fly or lift from a flat surface. Ah, so a lot of times when butterflies and moths emerge from their pupa or chrysalis, they need to kind of like hang themselves to allow their wings to dry. It sounds like yours, yours did that properly, although sometimes they'll get like a crimp in their wing that will prevent them from flying. Um, so, I mean, most adults only live for you know, a few weeks, maybe a month, maybe six, you know, six weeks. Most different species live different lengths of time. Um, you know, if this, if this butterfly ends up being able to fly, you could let her go. If not, you might just put her on a host plant and a male might come and find her. Although in all likelihood, um, her life will be a little shorter than it would be if she was able to fly. Um, you know, it just happens sometimes. Things happen. Um, you know, this is one of those types of animals that um, is very fecund. They have lots and lots of babies. Um, and that's because a lot of times some of them don't make it. Um, and so, you know, it may not have been anything you did at all. It may just be something that happened. So, um, you, you know, let her go on a host plant or on a nectar plant even. That might be better where she can get, a, get food. And then maybe she'll, she'll do okay um, and get out there and mate and have, lay some eggs. Um, and yeah, you said you have some, some more um, swallowtail eggs that might overwinter. <laughs> um, and yeah, the ones that hatch now, usually black swallowtails, if that's what they are, they typically go through like one more burst. Some of them, some of them are like, okay, I'm done. And they're just going to, you know, form a chrysalis and overwinter. And then sometimes they have few, one more generation. And so, yeah, just make sure they have a good food source. Um, this generation most likely will overwinter, but keep tabs on them because occasionally you'll get a really late emerger that's going to try to have one more generation before the end of the, the summer. So pretty cool. Um, ooh, Katie and Evie, what do caterpillars do in the winter? That's a great question too. Um, it depends on the species. So, so again, we have the whole life cycle, you know, egg, caterpillar, pupa, butterfly, or moth. 
some species, a lot of species, spend the winter as a pupa. Because if you're a pupa, you don't need any food. Um, you don't need plants or flowers. You know, a butterfly or a moth needs nectar, you know, food source, most of them. Caterpillars need leaves to eat, most of them. Some eat other things. Um, but as a pupa, eh, you just need some protection. You need a place to hang out. So a lot will overwinter as a pupa, as a chrysalis or a cocoon or a pupa. Um, but of some species it's different. Some species overwinter as a caterpillar to try to get ahead in the spring, like the red-spotted purple makes a little hibernaculum of folded leaf and hides in it over the winter and then comes out and is already like, a, you know, a bigger caterpillar starting in the spring. Um, woolly bears overwinter hiding in the leaf litter as caterpillars. And then some species overwinter as adults. So like a butterfly, uh, angle wing butterflies, um, they come out early in the spring because they have overwintered as an adult and they will hide in leaves and things like that to try to get through the winter. And then of course there's a monarch butterfly that migrates to Mexico to overwinter as an adult in, the, in a slightly warmer climate and then they migrate back north come spring. And so di different species do it differently. It's pretty amazing. Um, oh, Evie, I'm sorry, Evie. Thank you for the correction. Like the Pokemon. I wish I knew more Pokemon. My, my nephew would be happy if I learned. Oh, the biggest type of caterpillar from Jennifer, Jennifer's son. Um, the biggest caterpillar we have in North Carolina and the biggest caterpillar in North America is the hickory horn devil. That one I showed at the beginning of my presentation. If you didn't see it, send a note in the chat and I can show you show that picture again. But like I said, it gets to be like six inches long. It's like as big as a hot dog. It's pretty impressive. Um, it's, and it has spikes coming off of its body that look like they would kill you, but they can't hurt you at all. Um, so it's completely harmless. Um, and it's a really fun one to try to find. So that's a good one. Um, let's see, what other questions were in there? Wants to know if any, this is Jennifer's son again, that if any that don't have hairs or spikes are poisonous. Um, so like monarch caterpillars, they pick up the toxins from the milkweed plant, um, and so they can be poisonous. I don't know if to the level of like actually killing a, a, something that eats them, but it's very distasteful, and it can be harmful to things that eat them. So yes, um, if humans ate a whole bunch of monarch caterpillars, they would probably not agree well with our stomach. So yes, because those, those things would be toxic to humans as well. Um, but, you know, Poisonous, in order to be poisonous to us, it has to be ingested. So I just would recommend you don't go around eating caterpillars, you know, raw. Um, probably somewhere in the world, people eat caterpillars. You just have to eat the right ones. Um, but yeah, I would avoid that, I think. The only way that they typically can hurt us um, is the venom in those spines, the spikes um, on the species that have those stinging spines. So that's the really the only thing we need to worry about. And they could, you know, like some of them have big enough mouths and mouths they could kind of like pinch you a little bit, but... Like I said, that doesn't usually hurt. Um, their mouths aren't that big. Um, what else? The biggest I got, oh, is a better, Abby, is a better spot to find caterpillars in the woods or in an open field of flowers? This is a great question, Abby. So um, since caterpillars are eating leaves of plants, the flowers aren't really doing anything for them, unless there's a few species that'll eat flowers um, and the leaves of flowers. Um, the best place to look for caterpillars is usually on edge habitat because the, the adults will kind of like fly along the field with the flowers and then they'll be like, oh, look, here's a tree where I can, or a bush where I can lay my eggs and my babies will like it. So a lot of times we um, spend a lot of time searching along like roadsides, um, the edges of meadows, things like that. And, and that can be a really good place to find caterpillars if you want to go out and hunt for some caterpillars. Um, and then, um, okay. I don't know what your name is, Ender Aggie. Um, you had a monarch growing, uh, growing on your fennel. So, okay, that's kind of actually a fun question, non-question question, um, because monarchs only eat milkweed. The ones that eat fennel are black swallowtails, but they're really similar to monarchs. They have a slightly different, monarchs have more of a yellow, black, white, stripy pattern, and black swallowtails have a little bit of green in there, and it's a little bit blotchier. Um, and so you probably have a black swallowtail, um, and once again, I can, I have one, and I will show you my caterpillars now, for those of you who are still hanging out. Um, I have three different caterpillars here with me, and one of them is the black swallowtail, so this is a great uh, segue to taking a look at that. And um, so I will go ahead and show you the black swallowtail. This will just take a sec to get my phone launched. Oops. 
screen mirroring. All right, so got my camera. So this guy right here, there you go, is a black swallowtail caterpillar. And um, he is eating golden Alexander, that plant I mentioned is a native wildflower that these guys also like to eat. And let me see, I'm gonna give him a little pokey poke here. If he'll osmeterium for you. This is a tricky thing to do with only two hands. Sorry for the, oh, look how he's rearing his head back. Come on, oh, there it is, there it is. Now, I'm sorry, I cannot do smell -o vision so, oh, oh, he got my finger. It's going to smell all day now. But that is his osmeterium. See, he sucks it kind of back into his body there. And that is his defensive strategy, which is pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, my finger stinks now. Whew. <laughs> oh, well, what can you do when you're raising caterpillars? Eh, sometimes it happens. Um, ooh, Jennifer Malone, my daughter, has a question. What is the smallest caterpillar? I don't know the answer to that one. That one, you might have to do some, some research, get out there and find out. Cause you know what? I mean, there are so many different, there was what it's closer to 3000 different species alone in North Carolina. And I didn't even touch on, there's these things called micro moths that are like tiny, tiny little moths. And they're like grass tube rollers and things like that, that are really small. Um, and I don't know much about them because the ones I love and find are the big ones. Um, so I'm a little bit biased towards the bigger ones, unfortunately. I didn't give you a fair representation of caterpillars today. Um, but that's a really fun question. It might be something fun to get out there and um, to do some research on. And uh, Deb asked for some resources. I would be happy to, um, I have a couple links um, that I meant to have ready to drop in the chat and I don't, but we can, um, I'm sure I will talk to Carrie and Miranda and we will find a way to email you some resources. Um, so let's see. For those of you that are still hanging on, I'll show you another caterpillar because you know, I can do that. I have, I have two other species here. So I will try to go to my phone again. Okay, magnifier, here we go. Now this one I'm very, very excited about. My friend from the History Museum, she just retired from the History Museum and she found an Imperium moth laying eggs on her screen porch. And she collected some of those and my coworker Megan went over and collected some so we could raise some Imperium moth caterpillars. And you can see, let me get my finger in that shot so you can see how big this guy is. Not that big yet, but this guy gets to be almost as big as that huge hickory horn devil that I told you about. This species gets fairly large and turns into one of our largest moths, the imperial moth, which is a really pretty kind of yellow and pinkish colored moth. It's really cool. See, he's on the move. And they get all the, they have these hairs and the spikes on their body. Pretty amazing species of caterpillar. And it can be four different colors. It can be like red and green and brown and then like a peachy color too. And of course we got all brown ones. I keep hoping for a green one. Maybe they'll change colors, they get bigger. I don't know. Try to see if I have any more light over here to show you. There, you can see his spiracles on the side of his body and the orangey color of the horns, which is pretty cool. So I was really excited about that one. And then one more, let's see, what's he doing? Oh yeah, here he is. <laughs> See those fake eye spots on there? This is a tiger swallowtail. And these guys, zoom in on his fake eyes there because they're so cool. Yeah, so this is the Eastern tiger swallowtail, that yellow and black butterfly. And they actually do a little bit of that leaf, you know, hiding. So this guy you can see has made a little leaf shelter. It typically doesn't fold, oh, he just, He's getting ready to pupate, I bet. I think he just eliminated some of his gut contents on my leg. Um, Cause he's really big for a tiger swallowtail. So he's gonna be pupating soon. And he made a little leaf pad to hang out on. He doesn't usually fold a leaf fully over, but they, um, they kind of make that little pad that they sit on on the leaf, which is pretty cool. So, <sighs> 
Deb, that's a lot of leaves to eat. What kind do they munch? Which, which one? Um, clarify your question. I'll answer that. And then Abby, what do hornworm caterpillars eat? Oh boy. So hornworms um, are any of the ones, oh, this guy's eating. I'm just going to like hold him here for you guys to watch while I talk. Um, hornworms are any of the ones with the spiky butt and um, they eat a lot of different things. So the tobacco hornworm is the common one and that one um, eats our tomato plants, but also tobacco. Um, and then uh, a lot of other species eat a lot of different things. The squealing walnut sphinx caterpillar that I played for you earlier eats, um, we, tr we usually find them on hickory, although it's called the walnut sphinx, so probably also eats walnut. Um, the hummingbird clearwing that I showed you earlier eats viburnum. The snowberry clearwing, which is another day flying moth, eats um, coral honey or honeysuckle of all varieties. Um, and so basically, again, it's kind of species dependent. There's some that eat grapevine, there's some that eat trumpet creeper, there's some that eat um, Virginia creeper, so all of, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and oh, and Debbie, you're asking the imperial about what the imperial eats. Um, these guys eat a lot of different things. So <laughs> we, we did an experiment with Megan. Megan did an experiment with the eggs she got and put them on maple, sweet gum, and white oak. And so we have them eating all three right now. We're going to see if they turn different colors, and so far they haven't. Um, but they also, I found them on beach before, um, found them on maple. So a variety of different things for the imperial, imperial. So there are some species of moths, especially some of the bigger caterpillars that are a little bit more, we call it polyphagous, um, meaning they eat lots of different things. Um, sorry, another big word. But right now, this one is eating sweet gum. Um, and this is one of the ones that was on sweet gum. It's one of the biggest ones we had. So that's why I grabbed him so you could see. It's fun to see how fast he munches that leaf actually. I found a caterpillar on my porch that had light brown spikes. His head is black. And so is part of his back. His skin is yellow with green stripes. Oh boy. I'm going to put my email, Abby, in the chat and feel free to send me a picture of that. I can't really get a mental picture of that. And so um, go ahead and send me a picture and I will be happy to look that up if I don't know what it is off the bat. And if anybody else on this call has an idea as to what that might be, feel free to chime in. There, oh, everyone in the meeting. Yeah, so there's my email. I work at the museum. Feel free to send me a picture of your caterpillar and I will see if I can, um, I can identify that one. Very cool. <laughs> oh, can I describe the stinky smell? Jennifer, if you're still on here, for your daughter. Um, I've heard people describe it as like concentrated parsley. So like if you got a whole bunch of parsley and you like crushed it up in your hand and then you sniffed it, it kind of smelled like that. Um, I've also heard people describe it as like vomit because I think of the acidity of it. It smells a little vomity. It's actually faded or was it this hand? Oh yeah, it was this hand. It's faded a bit now though. I don't think it got me too good. Um, I think it smells kind of like, I don't know, musky almost too. So that's a good question. Um, <laughs> what else, any others? Alrighty, sharp green smell, Deb, yeah. I, I agree with that too. Abby, how do you send a picture? Um, you'll just have to send me an email with an attachment to my email um, if that works for you. I don't think you can do it in Zoom. So you'll just have to go to your email and uh, send me send me a picture. So, all right, y'all, thank you so much for your time today. Um, you have my email. If you have other questions, I'm always happy to answer them if you have ID questions. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and sticking around to hear all of the cool caterpillar bits. Um, very cool. Hugo, Hugo give us a, a wrap up. Sure thing. So. Melissa, that was amazing. So thank you, thank you very much. I mean, you have to invite me to your house to see all those caterpillars. <laughs> Anytime you go. <laughs> yeah. So, and thank you everybody for attending this program. Um, but what is a backfest without the backfest shirt? So if you go to backfest.org, you can uh, get one of the shirts. And if you join or renew the museum membership, you can get one for free. And good news, so the museum is resuming on-site operations this Tuesday, so the 22nd. We are so, so excited to see you again. 
If you want to go to the museum, please visit naturalsciences.org to get your free ticket. And again, check backfest.org because we still have a lot of programs ready for, for you. So have a wonderful weekend and see you in the next program. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody, goodbye.